Hey, SVC Volleyball fans, this is Shane Combs, SVC Sports Talk Plus. Uh, just coming at you. I'm going to talk a little SVC Volleyball here as we transition out from the regular season on in the tournament. As always, thank you, Dr. Chris Good, for all the support you on the YouTube channel uh, to help us uh, uh, spread the word about our, our, our local athletes and, and talk about our great league and especially the, the level that our league plays uh, the sport of volleyball. And when I, when I break down the past season, uh, you know, it's, it's, since we talked last, the Dana finishes off the gold ball season. And, and you know, the gold ball season is probably a surprise. I wouldn't say Adina winning the league is that big a surprise. I mean, when we left the preview, I think that's certainly a team that we thought was very capable. Uh, obviously had two of the top five hitters in, in uh, Burns and Day. And then obviously the level of defense they, they play. And uh, you, you certainly knew they were going to be in the mix just because, again, uh, Adina Volleyball seems to always uh, be in the mix. But again, them finishing off the gold ball run is outstanding. And it certainly didn't come easy. I mean, they, they went in five, what, at Uniota, at Huntington, even at Southeastern. Uh, so uh, maybe even got pushed four a couple times uh, beyond that. So uh, certainly uh, had some of the parity in the league that we thought we were going to have. Uh, but again, the, that Adina team, I thought where they really separated themselves, again, was obviously day and, and or Burns and Day there at the net and rotations one two three with with Burns and then four five six with with Day, but it was really the defense as well. I mean, when you think of Dalton and Smith and then uh, Cameron Sowers, it, it was almost like you're playing with three liberos. I mean, just defensively, the the way they kept the ball off the the the, the floor, uh, pass on target, they made life a lot easier for their setter. Um, and I just thought they were terrific in terms of their ability to serve, receive, and, and to d defend in the back row there. So congratulations to Adina. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about their tournament trail here in just a little bit. But, you know, hats off to Huntington as well. I mean, Huntington goes, what, 12-2, and 19-3, I think it is, with the Chillicothe loss. And, again, the Chillicothe loss surprised me a little bit. But, you know, early in the year, you'll remember, I thought Chillicothe was going to be a lot closer to Miami Trace at the top of the FAC come – you know, as it plays out, it seems like they're a little closer to Hillsborough, maybe there with a little bit of a gap to Miami Trace, but still a really good volleyball team. But nonetheless, Huntington, 19-3, and three, uh, just a terrific year. They were this close to, you know, doing something that hadn't been done there at Huntington in a long, long time. So certainly an, an amazing year, uh, you know, led by the great all-around talent of, of Casey Carroll. And uh, I thought she was terrific this year. And I mentioned clear back in the preview coverage with, with Allie Baker and then, you know, you, you throw in uh, Houseworth and, and her, what she ended up bringing uh, to the high school program. They, they really had a nice balance of attack that could survive some rotations when Carol went to the back row. Obviously, with, with the, the 5 1 setter McCloskey, which I'll talk a little bit more here in a little bit, but uh, I, I just thought they were really, really good. And again, it. You'll, you'll, you'll see as I talk about a lot of teams, this league could have went a lot of different ways, even not just in the champion, but really all the way down through four or five because of all the four and five set matches. But uh, Huntington, Huntington survived a lot of five set matches. And, and if you lose those 12 and two, all of a sudden turns into a, say a nine and five, and it's still a good year, but you don't feel nearly the same about it. But again, their ability to survive a lot of those and, and, and win the close ones really allowed them to have a special year. And when you when you talk about that very thing, Uniota is a great example of that. You know, Uniota is a team at the beginning of the year because they had so many names that we kind of had known from the past. They're on the other side of that. You know, they lose, what, uh, see, in five uh, to Adina. They lose to Huntington in five twice. I think they lost Southeastern in five. I want to say they lost to maybe maybe they maybe they won a couple more. But my my point is that when I say difference of twelve and two down to the eight and six, a lot of times it's just winning those close matches. And if you win, if you've been around sports long enough, you you understand this too. You win a couple of those clear back in the first round, and your season just has a different mo well, momentum to it. it, has a different feel to it. The next time you're in that situation you have a little bit more confidence or a little bit more understanding how to get the job done. So I think there's that domino effect. Certainly don't take anything away from Uniota. You know, we mentioned clear back at the beginning of the year, we, we knew Park would have a really good year in the middle, and she did. I know Detweiler went through some injuries, and length provided them a little bit. But on the outside, they had the experience of Stewart. Astali was very uh, much improved, uh, did a nice job of, of, of coming on as a hitter this year. 
Uh, they struggled with passing early in the year, but West uh, did, did give them a little bit of stability and experience in that area. Uh, they used the younger setter bats and early in the year, went to Stanley uh, later in the year, and again, both of them uh, were fine. Uh, again, Uniota was solid, but for whatever reason, just never did get over the hump in a couple of those uh, four and five set matches early in the year, and it just kind of domino effect out of control on them, you know, in, into the second half of the year. So, again, I think they were, what, eight and six. Um, I can't remember what they were for overall, maybe 14 and eight, I believe it was. Again, not a bad year, um, but but two or three of those matches go the other way, and we're sitting here talking about an 18 and four type of year, and you feel much, much different about it. So as you go Southeastern's Zane Trace, they tie there at seven and seven. They played some crazy matches against each other. Uh, obviously, a special talent and Logheed returning as player of the year. They had a nice newcomer and done there in the middle, and, and they certainly had um, the the ability to to go toe to toe with anybody on a given night. Zane Trace, you know Platt, she's that stat sheet stuffer. Um, I talked several times about. Uh, how I thought Snavely was really, really a, a breakout star in the league. And Scott getting healthy and coming on there, that, that was a nice lift for Zane Trace. And then, you know, you go down the list, you know, I highlighted Clark there at Westfall. I know uh, Volgamore and uh, Moore there at Piketon had some big nights. I know for Paint Valley coming in the year, we knew Glassburn as a passer and Dye as a hitter. Uh, Conley had some breakout games for them. So, you know, as, as the league gets into their all-league and they name some kids and all that stuff, all, all will be well earned as it as it always is in this particular league, but it gets me thinking about the topic of player of the year, which I talk about each and every year on here. And you know, this year really tested some of my my stuff because I have the setter bias, but I don't know that the setter position. Although you'll have you'll have multiple all league kids from the setter position, I don't know that the setter position brings uh, the player of the year to the forefront, and then. I also have another huge, huge uh, feeling each and every year that the player of the year has to play all the way around. And this year, I'm going to tell you, Katie Burns really tested me on this. I mean, you look at her, uh, I, I don't know how many kids just could take over a match in particular rotations quite the way she could do so uh, offensively and defensively. Uh, so so that, that was a factor. Um, you go eye test. You know, Logheed's the returning player of the year. And, you know, her role kind of changed this year. Her role went all over the place. So, therefore, the production came down. I still think it's a production award. So, that's tough. If, if you're going to tell me that she's the most skilled volleyball player in terms of all the areas of the game, it's hard for me to argue that. But I still think it's a production award. So with that in mind, I've got to go Casey Carroll. I mean, for her to get Huntington to 12-2, and two, all, she certainly didn't do it alone, but I'm saying for her to, to be the go-to and to carry that program to that 12-2 and two mark, I think she's the young lady that at all six rotations obviously offers an amazing put-away hitter at the net. She was an outstanding server. Uh, she was an improved defensive player throughout her career. And I, and I just think that she probably uh, wins the award in my my eyes this particular year. Again, there's two, three other young ladies that are right there. And if they end up winning the award, you wouldn't hear a thing from me because they're outstanding. And, and I, I just think our league's that good. But that's probably the way I would go about it. So the other thing I get asked a lot about, Shane, why the setter biased? Well, I've always been pretty consistent on that. I you know, I prefer the 5-1. I'm not against the 6-2, especially if you have a balance of hitters that, that need to hit, especially if you have a young lady who's an elite hitter. But out of the back row, you still want her to touch the ball all the time. I love that. But there's just something about the organization. I think Huntington's a great example of that this year. I thought the 5-1 setting of Leah McCloskey just really, really organized the Lady Huntsman this year. She's a great leader. She did a good job. She understood where the ball needed to go and when it needed to go there. Uh, and I think she's a great example of uh, of why I feel that way. So quickly looking into the tournament, I don't love the draw for some of the league, but there are other parts of the league that are that are awesome. I mean, I, I, I think Adina uh, is, is set for another nice run. I think they'll, they'll roll in some of the early rounds. Uh, some of the weaknesses they have, I don't think will be exposed before you get to the district final, regional semifinal type of level. 
Um, I believe Southeastern would line up in their particular division with Southwestern, the district final. I think that's a that's a dangerous opponent for Southwestern. I think there'd be a lot of pressure on Southwestern, but I think Southeastern would be a very dangerous opponent for them. And then, as always, the bracket that jumps out at me is where the SVC is going to beat up on each other. That Huntington, Westfall, Zane Trace bracket, not take anything away from North Adams, just usually our league has a way of separating itself in the postseason. And if that ends up being the case there, that's something that's going to be an SVC round robin, so to speak, to see who, who comes out of that. So looking forward to breaking it all down. Thank you, Dr. Chris Good, for allowing us to do that. Um, we'll follow the tournament trail, and then uh, I'll be back with you on SVC Sports Talk real soon. Thanks, everyone.